Caught on camera, amazing moment. A woman gives birth to a premature baby girl at 30,000 feet on a airplane flight from Taiwan to Los Angeles. What does this have to do with the flat earth? Well, here it is folks, check this out. I'm gonna read the actual page here from dailymail.co.uk. Dated October 13, 2015. This is the published time or date. China airline flight landed in Alaska with an extra passenger, the newborn baby, after expecting the mother to give birth to a baby girl um, several weeks a little bit early. The Taiwan to Los Angeles flight was forced to make an emergency landing on Thursday after a Taiwanese passenger water broke six hours into the 19 hour journey okay so listen up we have taiwan and we have los angeles it's pretty straight flight right across the pacific ocean agree agreed alaska is way up north on top of canada okay why is it that the emergency stop went to Alaska. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. Well, this is the this is the facts here, folks. Check this out. All right, skeptics believe the Earth is a globe. The Earth is a sphere, and not a ball. Well, if we take a look at these pictures here, this is going to explain everything. Here we have the map of the globe. These are the destination points. So from Taiwan to, yeah, it's a pretty straight flight, but they take a detour and go to Alaska. If you look at the map of the globe as a sphere, this is what it looks like. If we look at the flat earth model, okay, we have Taiwan, we have Alaska in the middle, Ta and LA at the end. So Taiwan over here, Alaska is in the middle, LA, Los Angeles on the left. This is the flight pattern and the reason why they stopped in Alaska, it's because it's on the way there. Six hours into a 19 hour flight, they decide to make an emergency stop in Alaska instead of going to LA. Why? Because LA is way farther than Alaska. All right. It doesn't get any more evident than this. It's time to wake up, folks. You saw it first on A Entertainment. A flight from Shanghai going to Munich, Germany. Now, this young lady that passed away, y'all rest her soul. But what can be gleaned from the flight is, uh, if you pull up the link, uh, the article link below, you can see this with me, is what went down was that they had to stop off at an airport um, due to a medical emergency and uh, what actually went down is when they touched down at this airport, um, you know, they, they had to take um, a, a, a stop off in flight. Now, what was going on, though, with the situation is here is the airport way up here. OK, so on a globe flight, it makes no sense um, to go up there. Now, you might say, look, it was an emergency. Well, look, guys, all of China is right here. There's so many places to stop along the way. You just can't get me to buy that they had to go all the way over um, that far into mul multiple countries over, okay, if they're needing an emergency land, all right? There's plenty of places to do it. But, it, you know, on a flat earth, it makes perfect sense because that's where they were flying across. But um, just bear with me a moment. And as you can see right here, Shanghai to Germany should never at any point in time uh, cross Mother Russia except for right through here. I mean, it just should not because Munich is actually, you know, if we're looking at Munich, it is down in the far corner reaches of Germany, right there. So there's no reason at any point, to, I mean, that is so far off the map to go up there. It just, it makes absolutely no sense until we pull up the world to Most High Yah created and we see that flying from Shanghai to Germany would put you right over um, that area in Russia and right near that airport, then it all starts coming together.
Okay, so I've been uh, just checking out flights around the southern hemisphere and just trying to hop from continent to continent and finding out just how ridiculous it is. So let's follow these planes and see if they can prove the plane. Uh, first, I'm starting in Australia and I want to go uh, from Sydney to Santiago, Chile, which Google Maps tells us is 7,000 miles. Uh, I've been using uh, Fair Compare. Oops, wrong one. And you can use whatever you like. Um, just type in your to and from. Brings up all your flights, different carriers, um, and all your different um, scenarios here. So actually, it looks like a lot of flights, but there's just six separate flights. And out of those, there's only one non-stop, there is one one-stop, and then the rest are all twos and three stops. So we'll check out this one, or non-stop. And it says it is a 7,000 mile flight, 12 hours and 40 minutes, from Sydney to uh, Santiago. But I don't think this flight ever takes off. Uh, it's available only Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday also to kind of pinch you out and make you do something different. Um, this flight to uh, uh, from Auckland, um, it says it's one flight there, and then, uh, what, a non-stop from Auckland. I checked those out already as well. That would be a 6,000-mile flight in 9 hours, and or I think it's 11 hours, actually. Uh, actually, we can look at it. Here it is right here. Yeah, it's 11 hours, 20 minutes for 6,000 miles. But I don't think either one of these two flights are real. Um, they're just kind of there to um, keep guys like me from figuring this shit out. <laughs> Okay, so basically you can't do either one of these, which would only be um, 7,000 miles. Your next option jumps doubles already. So you're looking at 13,000 to 15,7. And all, your, all, all of these flights up here are all going to United States airports. These are all United States airports. And then this YVR is Vancouver, Canada, and these are all Canadian airports. So basically, if you can't get one of these straight across flights, then your next options are either United States or Canada, which doesn't make any sense at all. And the time, holy cow, it goes from, you know, 33 hours to 55 hours depending on what you end up with on these. So let's just take a look at the maps. I map these out. And look, you know, it just looks ridiculous what you have to try and do. You can't just go straight across. You have to actually get up into the northern hemisphere and then come back down. So that doesn't make any sense. So I mapped it on the flat earth map. And whoa, okay, now it makes sense. This is Sydney, Australia on the flat earth map. So yeah, you would want to stop at Vancouver or San Francisco or LA on your way, because it is on the way. Um, Alright, the next one I checked out, let's see, was Johannesburg, South Africa to Perth, Australia and I chose Perth just because it's the first city you would get to. It's a straight across shot from uh, Johannesburg which is right here to Perth which is right here. So um, look at all the flights that came up here and once again we only have one non-stop uh, then two one stops uh, from Singapore and then a bunch from Sydney which are kind of strange I'll show you that in a sec here um, so let's just go to the maps 
Alright, these are the routes they want you to take. Uh, there's three separate airports right in this little area. This is Dubai and uh, Daho and i um, not sure what that one is. Uh, this one's Hong Kong, this one's Singapore, and here's Perth right here. Uh, these two in black, this is the um, non-stop that they have to Perth. And this one's kind of a weird one. There's a little tiny island right here called Meritus. And, you know, it's almost, you know, a straight shot. But it's got a 20-hour layover. <laughs> so I don't know how many people would actually opt for that flight. But the reason I put these in black is because I don't think they exist either. And then you got all these flights that go to Sydney, which is here. So, what, you're going to fly right over your destination, fly 2,000 extra miles, and then hop around to all these other cities before coming to Perth. So this is kind of a weird, weird one I can't really figure out yet. Um, especially when you look at the map, uh, the flat earth map, all the other routes make sense because yeah it's on the way here's Perth here's South Africa all the stops are on the way um, this is that Meritus though so yeah I don't know maybe uh, these are all the flights to Sydney so it still looks like a pretty long shot to Sydney um, but who knows maybe maybe this map isn't even correct who knows I don't know uh, let's see the last one I mapped was I wanted to go from Cape Town South Africa to Buenos, Arge uh, Buenos Aires Argentina and these are the routes that they were giving me and there wasn't uh, you know I could show you that um, they don't even have a non-stop so you don't even have that option to just go straight across so all of your other options are here you can go to the uh, London Amsterdam <laughs> Istanbul uh, Dubai again um, but you can't go straight across and then yeah, there's a couple stops near Rio de Janeiro and another one over here. I can't remember exactly, but yeah, strange. And then I mapped it on this map. And you can see that, you know, they aren't, uh, South, South America is pointing away from the way it looks on the Mercator map. So it's not just a straight across shot like it looks on that map anyways, but yeah, you can see all these flights have to go towards the North Pole first and then down. So there you have it. Uh, I encourage you to check it out because you can use any of these other cities around. Um, even trying to just, you know, I tried to take some shots at just the shortest jump right across and then you still can't do it. They make you do other things. So you just can't get these straight easy, you know, you would think would be flights, but they're not. Okay, so this video is a bit of a follow-up to my previous two videos on gyroscopic navigation and, um, and all of that. Um, I had a couple of points I wanted to add. The first one based on a comment that I just got, um, which just really blew me away. Um, it was so simple and yet it's... However, it seems you could also prove this by never leaving home, unless there's something I'm not understanding. If you were to just set the gyro in a gimbal base where it could move freely and then put it in motion with the with its axis in a vertical position. In the next six hours, when you see the axis slowly move to a horizontal position at the as the base rotates with the globe Earth. If it doesn't, then the Earth is not a spinning ball. Okay, so after taking a few seconds to let what he's saying absorb, uh, I was like, holy cow, I think, <laughs> I 
think he's right. And that's pretty insane. Because they don't ever talk about that. And you would think they would. I mean, right there in the film, he's saying that the gyroscope resists the pull of Earth. It does not stay in alignment with with gravity or with the surface of the Earth, right? So that's when it goes into all the uh, explanation of how the magnetic compass supposedly is what corrects it. And that's a whole other thing, but I'm, I'll get into that in a minute. But it's totally true that if if the gyroscope on the gimbal, when it's spun up fast enough, is going to resist the resist the gravity of the Earth, you know, when a any kind of vehicle is moving around the ball, well, then the same thing is going to be apply just being in place on the surface of the Earth and the surface, and then the surface moves. And like you said, six hours—that's a quarter of the the rotation day. That would give you a 90 degree difference. Should be pretty simple to simple thing to prove. Now, of course, n- none of the um, you, you don't hear any of the Navy guys talking about this. And the crazy part is is that in a nutshell, I think this what I think it means is that really I. The only way a gyroscopic navigation system could work is on a flat Earth. I mean, period. Because when you think about what they are saying, what are are explaining about how the thing works, and that it it does not stay aligned with with the surface of the Earth, right? It always has to be. They're they're talking about how it needs to be adjusted when. You know, a gyroscope is in a vehicle that moves around the Earth. But at the same time, the Earth is constantly moving. So that's going to be throwing you out of alignment from the, you know, the true up and down as well. Um, So how is a magnetic compass going to know how to, or anything else for that matter, to know how to uh, adjust the gyroscope in relation to the Earth um, accounting for both the motion, the you know, the movement of the vehicle, whether it's a plane or a sub or a ship or whatever, and the motion of the surface of the Earth around the center of the Earth, right? Which is supposedly where gravity is pulling every, everything down towards, right? So you've got two, you know, two constantly changing factors um, all the time. Well, at least one, because, you know, even if a gyroscope is sitting still, it's still moving on the surface of the Earth. But there's nothing to really... I mean, so the navigation system needs a navigation system? I mean, it's it's completely... it's absurd. And then, when you think take it a step further, I mean, obviously, according to the Copernican model, um, you know, the Earth is not the only thing that's moving. So if rigidity in space, this this principle of rigidity in space tells us that, you know, the gyroscope will resist, I mean, that clip says it will resist all forces put upon it, right? So gravity, and this bears out too because um, we know that when they use gyroscopes in jet planes, right, That so they always know which way is up is down and they're doing all these, uh, you know, dogfighting maneuvers and barrel rolls and subjecting the pilot and the plane to uh you know lots of g-forces so if you're doing dogfighting maneuvers in in a fighter jet let's say and you've got your gyroscope on its gimbals and there so the pilot always knows which way is up and down and doesn't have to you know look out his window that means the gyroscope is resisting several g's of force so if a gyroscope can can function in that kind of an uh an application Right, going hundreds of miles an hour, moving at crazy speeds, and having to constantly stay level and resist that many g-forces on it. Then, wh- what if it can resist that strong of, uh, of gravitational forces? Then it can—it's resisting all of them, right? Um, so not just the Earth's gravitation, but any of the other, you know, gravities that are lesser than the Earth's that are supposedly. Um, functioning 
throughout the solar system. So, I mean, there's lots, of, my point is that there's lots of, there's lots of motions that are supposedly happening in a Copernican model, not just the Earth's rotation, but um, the Earth orbiting around the sun, the solar system rotating around the galaxy, the galaxy rotating around, you know, the universe and so on. So, hypothetically, you would think that um, <laughs> the, uh, a, a truly um, precision functioning you know, military industrial grade gyroscope would be holding its fixed position, its rigidity in space against all of those motions. So if you fired up a gyroscope, shouldn't you just see it doing all kinds of crazy things? I mean, shouldn't it just be moved, not just moving 90 degrees over six hours, but it could be doing all kinds of motions because of all the different orbital things that are supposedly happening. But no, we just, it stays in place, right? Um, and we're talking here, of course, we're talking about the kinds of gyroscopic navigation systems that they use, you know, submarines and, and ships and things. You know, these, we're not talking about toy gyroscopes, just for the record. But the other thing I was thinking, too, was just back on that video with the, uh, the gyroscope and supposedly being corrected by the, the magnetic compass in that 1960 Navy training video, uh, the more I've thought about that, the more absurd that is for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, because, you know, a gyroscope is designed to um, maintain orientation in terms of, you know, several axes, and yet simple, simply relying on a magnetic compass to tell you where north is, well, that's going to tell you, that's only at the most going to give you you know, orientation for, for one axis, right? And the more, and depending on where you are on the globe, uh, you know, north is always going to be in one direction, but you're, it's going to, it won't tell you like where the plane, where the, where the plane should be depending on where you are on the globe, because, you know, obviously if you're up in Alaska, you know, you know it's going to be different than if you were down in, you know, South America or something. Um, you know, a magnetic compass doesn't doesn't point you directly at where the magnetic north is or the north pole is. It only gives you a, you know, it's basically a two-dimensional device, um, so which is kind of worthless for for supposedly re re uh, calibrating a, a gyroscope. Um, not to mention in this other video, it actually explains how you have several issues with magnetic compasses themselves in terms of. Um, magnetic variation and, and deviation, I believe. And anybody who's ever used a map and compass, like when they're out hiking, uh, understands that, you know, magnetic north is not just this this clean, easy thing that is the same wherever you are. Depending on where you are in the country or the world, man, magnetic north is always warped. So you always have to adjust for that in your calculations um, when using a compass, right? You always have to delineate, um, you know, depending on where you are, like for the magnetic north. Now, how is a magnetic compass that is supposedly in a plane hooked up to a gyroscope going to know exactly where it is in the world to account for the amount of magnetic uh, declination? That's the word, declination. To account for the correct amount of declination, to know where true north is, to then be able to reorient the gyroscope, all in split-second timing. Um, it's just it just gets ridiculous so I think the bottom line is that uh, yeah gyroscopes the only way that they could be of any use is on a, a completely flat plane where up is always up and you know sideways is always sideways and down is always down and other, otherwise it just it, it contradicts itself the explanations they give for gyroscopes and how they function contradicts their own model all right, so we're going to be talking about the attitude instrument, the horizon attitude indicator on planes. And uh, the question is, how does it adjust for the curvature of the Earth while flying uh, in the air? So to get started, um, we know anybody that's flown on a plane, if you fly from across the country in the United States, when they get a cruising altitude, the plane stays level for hours and hours and hours. There is no adjustment for the curvature of the Earth. 
and we want to find out why. So if the Earth were a sphere, airline pilots would have to constantly correct their altitudes downward so as not to fly off into outer space. If the Earth were truly a sphere of 25,000 miles circumference, uh, a pilot wishing to simply maintain their altitude at a typical cruising speed of 500 miles an hour would have to constantly dip the nose downward and descend 2,777 feet, that's over a half mile, every single minute. Otherwise, without the compensation, in one hour's time, the pilot would find themselves 166,660 feet, there's that number again, or 31.5 miles higher than expected. A plane flying at a typical 35,000 feet wishing to maintain their altitude at the upper rim of the so-called troposphere in Wood Iowa would find themselves over 200,000 feet high into the mesosphere with a steadily ra raising trajectory the longer they go. I have talked to several pilots and no such compensation for Earth's supposed curvature is ever made. When pilots set an altitude, their artificial horizon gauge remains level and so does their course. To maintain a 30,000 foot altitude around a round Earth, the airplane would have to be angled significantly lower. All right, so how's the math on this? This is basic, basic spherical geometry, folks. It's not difficult to comprehend. From the surface of the Earth, the escape velocity is about 7 miles per second or 25,000 miles per hour. Given that the initial speed an object needs no additional force applied to complete to escape Earth's gravity. Now this comes from a NASA telling us how we would have what we would have to do to escape the pull of Earth's gravity. Now here's a chart. And so simply what we're trying to calculate is how many feet does the Earth have to have, have, have curvature if it has to curve? How many feet as each mile traveled would we have to uh, uh, see the curvature of the Earth? All right. So it's a basic formula here to determine how much the Earth falls away on a curve. You take miles squared times 8 inches. That's miles times miles tied 8 inches to determine the distance of how much Earth would fall away. So here's a couple calculations. For 1 mile, it would be 5.33 feet. At 10 miles, now get the numbers here, 66.666 feet, or 1.26, 1 and a quarter miles. At 100 miles, now this works inversely now, the, the longer you go, the more inverse the relationship is. At 100 miles, you get 6,666.66 feet, or 12.62 miles. If a pilot is, uh, is flying around the curve of the Earth, then it sh he should be dipping the nose down um, every, every five minutes. He should be dipping the nose down to, to stay around the curve. But the thing that really um, uh, got me interested was, as you say, the gyroscope. In, in a plane, there is a, um, an artificial horizon, OK, and it's based on a gyroscope. And if you spin a gyroscope um, on a surface, it will want to stay upright. You can twist and tilt the surface as much as you like. The gyroscope will stay upright. So if a plane has a gyroscope, and it starts um, following the curve of the Earth, mm. the gyroscope would stay upright, which mm. means your, the uh, um, artificial horizon will start to, to roll backwards. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. Mm -hmm. That's absolute proof that a plane flies over a flat surface rather than a curved one. Because um, I asked the pilot um, on my last flight, uh, you know, does, do you ever notice the, the, auto, um, the artificial horizon? Uh, rolling backwards. He said, no, no, but the artificial horizon has complex electronics in it to, to make sure it knows where it is on the Earth and it compensates. But I went to um, the manufacturer of the artificial horizon and they confirmed to me that it's completely mechanical, nothing electronic in it at whatsoever. So it's, it's literally just a gyroscope that can freely move. So that right there is proof to me that um, you know, planes fly over a plane. So let's take a look at the artificial horizon attitude indicator, uh, how, how it works. Uh, with this instrument, the pilot receives instantaneous indication about pitch and roll. Roll indications are indicated at the top of the pitch with the aircraft image relative to the background in blue and brown. It uh, goes on to state that it's necessary for this to fly paramount for flying in instrumental meteorological conditions. Uh, here's a picture of it. The aircraft image on the instrument is fixed and the blue-brown background is able to move up and down. 
Some have brown and part of blue, blah, blah, blah. The gyro, as shown in the image to the right, right here, uh, the gyro lies horizontally in the inner gim gimbal ring. The outer gimbal is pivoted wingtip to wingtip and moves the background plate. The center of gravity of the gyro and the pendulous unit is below the suspension points, thus making sure the pendulous unit can erect and is able to keep the gyro in horizontal plane. Nowhere is there an electrical device or any adjustment whatsoever, whatsoever, to adjust for the curvature of the earth, which it would have to. And the math is at 500 miles per hour for a half mile, it would have to dip down every minute to stay on the curvature of the earth. This is a mechanical device. We need to go out to the uh, pilots who all believe that the adjustment for the curvature of the earth is done electronically in this device itself. It's not. It's a simple gyro device. There is no adjustment for the curvature of the earth, thus disproving the global heliocentric theory just in this one simple example. So here's what Wikipedia has to say about the attitude indicator or the artificial horizon attitude indicator as it's also known an attitude indicator ai artificial intelligence also known as a gyro horizon or artificial horizon or attitude director indicator is an instrument used in aircraft to inform the pilot of the orientation of the aircraft relative to the earth's horizon it indicates pitch and bank and is primarily as a primary instrument for the flight in instrument meteorological conditions. In closing here, folks, uh, we can go to every pilot and every pilot will tell you it's the electronics which adjusts for the curvature and just show them this piece or just show them every evidence you want of how the altitude adjusting horizon, artificial horizon works. And it's basically just a gyroscope, strictly mechanical. There's all the proof you need to disprove the curvature of the earth, folks. It's right here in front of us. It's super simple. All the pilots have been programmed to believe it's already in the instrumentation. When here we clearly prove, along with allegedly Dave, that it is clearly not. Hey guys, it has come to my attention that I've gotten a few comments once in a while from skeptics supposedly trying to show me flights that fly over Antarctica. Their claims are false, however, and I will address this issue just to put an end to it. This is a link one skeptic showed me that shows a flight from Sydney, Australia to Johannesburg, South Africa, which supposedly flies over Antarctica, debunking the flat earth. However, closer inspection shows that the flight merely skirts past the edge of Antarctica, never going over the continent as a whole, and gives the passengers a view of some of the edge. As you can see, this is the link they showed me supposedly showing the flight and I'm scrolling down right now this is the photo taken from the 747 showing the view of Antarctica and as you can see they are merely skirting past the edge it even says on the page quote after leaving Australia the Boeing heads for one of the most southern routes in the world you will get to see some of the off shoots of the Antarctic Continental Ice Sheet, end quote. Did you guys hear that? The off shoots. The edge. They are not flying over anything. Along with this article, someone linked me this picture, supposedly showing the same flight. And as we all know, I just debunked that. There is no flight that flies over Antarctica, period. I even found this image shown from a flight path that someone had taken who flew the exact same route. And what do you know, it shows the plane skirting past the edge. I don't know if you can see it, so I'll show the two parts separately. Another route someone showed me that supposedly flies over Antarctica as well was from somewhere in Australia to somewhere in South America. 
but just like the previous flight, that is untrue. Here are some images I took from Google Earth showing a path from Australia to South America, and it merely skirts past the edge. Here is even a screenshot I found showing the path from Australia to South America, and once again, it merely skirts past the edge of Antarctica. So I looked up why there aren't any flights over Antarctica, and I found a few interesting pages. On this page, someone asks, Do any commercial transcontinental flights fly over Antarctica? And the answer someone gave was, Due to the arrangement of the three populated southern continents, flying over Antarctica wouldn't actually be shorter for most routes. South America, Africa, and Australia form a rough triangle at the bottom of the world and the shortest leg between their largest airports misses most of Antarctica. Another reason they said was ETOPS extended operations rules cover where twin engine jets can fly. Antarctica is considered off limits for twin engine jets even though it is technically quote land. They also say the real reason no commercial flight flies over Antarctica is that there are special aviation rules for flights that do. What do you guys think about that? Does that sound like an excuse to you? This other one I found on some travel site. Someone asked, what, if any, regularly scheduled airline flights pass over Antarctica? And the answer was, no scheduled flights pass directly over Antarctica. So yeah. Those of you saying out there that they're trying to show flights that fly over Antarctica, I just debunked you guys. Caller, are you there? You're talking to Jaren as a Monday Night Raw? What's up? Hey guys, how's it going? Good. Hey, this is uh, Jonathan, the uh, flight instructor in Iowa. Hey, how's it going? Hey. Hey, good. Hey, this is uh, calling in to check in with the, uh, the previous caller that got called in about the flying. I, uh, I had to call in and... and uh, make my comment on a couple things Please. uh definitely can do a test with airplanes um and i'm definitely in for doing that if anybody comes up with something they want to test um we've got access we've got the airplanes to do it i'd love to do something um so if you guys come up with any good tests let me know um and we can definitely navigate without the gps totally doable oh, not a problem uh yeah you know 100 miles 200 miles whatever we need to do that's, that's crazy all right then can you mm-hmm. can you email me? It, it's Jaronism at Yahoo. Also, any kind of like uh, prices on any of that, just so I can get an idea. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to Bob about it and see what he thinks um, would be the best plan of attack. And then we'll yeah, let's schedule some because we've been wanting to do something like that, and we yeah. haven't. I even asked Absolutely. BOP. I'm like, dude, you're rich. You have private jet. I'm sure. <laughs> like, come on, let's do this. But yeah. uh, no, we don't need a big fancy jet. We can do it with a small airplane, and um, we could, we could, yeah. The cost wouldn't be hardly anything at all. We can, uh, we can work that out, um, and I'd, I'd be happy to do it. I think it'd be great to get a test out there. I've been thinking about doing it, but um, I just don't know exactly what to test on. I mean, I see it every day, so it's hard for me to kind of, I don't know what people want to see, you know. Where do you stand right now? Are you uh, still believing in the globe, or do you think? No, no, <laughs> no. I, I, I just <laughs> no. Uh, uh, my both myself and my girlfriend are flight instructors, and we teach people to fly. And we were both just in the last two days. We both came back from separate flights with students, and we both came back. And we're like, it was a really clear day, and we both said to each other, you know, wow, you know, we can see so much that we should not be able to see. We can see wind farms that are. Uh, 50 miles away that should be, uh, if we did the math, it should be 500 feet below the um, horizon from where we were viewing them at. We're not up really high, we're only a thousand feet off the ground, and uh, we, it's, we see it all the time. It's, it's obvious, wow. and our instrumentation stays level, so no, it's amazing. It's pretty yep. clear to us. I know, I want to go to Amazon and see if there's a, uh, a gyro that he could take on plane. and something, you know, like, because that's a well, that's our that's our that's our uh, gyro that we have in the aircraft. You know, I mean, it, right. it's there, it's working. It's just the problem is you can't get any information, and I've tried to track that down as well. Um, I did a bunch of research trying to find the uh, how the gyros are made, what you know, the internal components, and you cannot find anything out about them. They're just they're yeah. perfect devices. They're, they're, and that's why they always show you exactly where you're at, but they don't take into account. Hey, I should be upside down on the ball, or hey, I should have. I'm on sideways, or exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, they have no correction for for the for gravity or anything like that. They're independent. So, 
Nope. This anyway, is going to be so something that comes yeah, out well, the next the next year. It's coming out because yeah. there's no curvature, and, and pilots. Are we understand so. you go one way and you you can come back to where you came from, but that doesn't mean it's a ball. No. You have, there's a lot of other things that go into just saying it's a ball because we start here and, and come back here. And I've gotten calls like crazy from other pilots. They'll call me, you know, and uh, and I've talked with lots of other pilots, professional pilots, guys, airline guys that are retired out, and they they all admit to it. They all say, "Yep," they said. They've seen the same things, and they said the problem is you're never going to get a current airline guy to admit it because risk of losing their job. job, You know, Um, yeah, yeah, I'm self-employed. I do my own thing. I'm not afraid to say what I want to say about it. But, uh, but yeah. So I mean, we all believe it. All my friends uh, that are pilots, they're all we all agree on it. It's not. I don't know. So that's amazing. I love it. I can't wait. I'm so glad we met you on the phone. The airline guys that are retired out and they they all admit to it they all say yep they said they've seen the same things and they said the problem is you're never going to get a current airline we all believe it all my friends uh, that are pilots they're all we all agree on it the airline guys that are retired out and they they all admit to it they all say yep they said they've seen the same things and they said the problem is you're never going to get a current airline we all believe it all my friends uh, that are pilots they're all we all agree on it 